more self-confident, without being arrogant, a much more self-confident and self-assured manner than had been the case for so long. Um, that transformed the way people in Ireland viewed the Irish question, the Northern Irish question, the relationship with Great Britain. And instead of crying in our soup and regretting what had happened in the past and engaging in all kinds of uh, uh, activities, increasing numbers of Irish people in the South began to look at this uh, uh, issue in a much more open uh, way, uh, opening the mind and extending the hand towards the other side. And 10 years ago this year, uh, the Good Friday Agreement was signed, and it was a, a very far-reaching uh, bargain. Everybody concerned moved very great distance in historic terms, in national psychological terms. The people in Southern Ireland voted 94% in favour of the Good Friday Agreement, which was a bargain with the British and a compromise bargain with the Unionists in Northern Ireland also. And what did they vote for? One of the things they voted for in Southern Ireland was to remove from our national constitution the territorial claim in the form it existed over Northern Ireland. As somebody said, my father would be turning in his grave if he was alive today, um, my brother said whimsically. There were whole generations of Irishmen would be turning in their graves uh, had they seen that day. But that was the measure of the journey which people in Southern Ireland had travelled uh, in order to embrace a compromise that might stop the killing and open the prospects for a better future for everybody. By the same token, you had uh, people in Northern Ireland uh, committed to being a British, having a very strong sense of their Britishness, over a million of them, who agreed within Northern Ireland to have their representatives enter a power-sharing government uh, with the leadership of Sinn Féin, uh, which was closely allied with the IRA, whom they viewed as murderous terrorists, murderous terrorists who in their recollection had killed school bus drivers as well as soldiers and policemen, their sons, fathers, cousins and mothers. So for them, for the Protestant Unionists of Northern Ireland to vote by majority, to embrace shared government uh, with Sinn Féin uh, was really an enormous step for them, um, similar to the step that in the south of Ireland uh, we were prepared to take. And the British long since had signalled that they had no self selfish strategic reason for staying uh, in uh, uh, Ireland in the administrative sense. And they made it clear that if a majority in Northern Ireland were to vote in favour of uh, leaving the Union or moderating the relationship with the United Kingdom, well then uh, the British government in London uh, would respect that and would take action to give effect to that choice. Um, so everybody was uh, making com compromises. Um, that The arrangements that were put in place in, in 1998 uh, 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 have been on again, off again, uh, more or less functioning since then. It's not easy. It's not easy to develop new relationships, to go beyond the kind of tribal uh, hatreds that were so strong uh, for so long. You must remember that four-fifths of Ireland has a very, very strong sense of Irishness be as opposed to being British. And you might even say that for many years Irishness was self-defined as being, as much as anything else, not British. Uh, whereas a fifth of the country, a million strong in Northern Ireland, see themselves as essentially British and have no difficulty in reconciling within their own minds the fact that they are British and Irish uh, at the same time. Um, I'm reminded a little bit of my experience in Cyprus. 
I spent four years in Cyprus. And there you have a majority of Greek Cypriots on the island and a minority of Turkish Cypriots. And what's interesting is that the minority of Turkish Cypriots on the island feel very weak and threatened when they look beyond their streets and they see a majority, 80%, Greek Cypriot population, which has not always been their friend, and they fear being dominated. The Turkish Cypriots believe that they are the weaker party, and therefore it is incumbent on the stronger party to make the first gesture of reconciliation from a position of strength. The problem is, in Cyprus, that the Greek Cypriot community, which is in an 80% majority on the island, also sees itself as the weaker party. Why? Because they don't analyze the situation exclusively in the island context. They look 40 miles offshore to the mainland of Turkey, a regional colossus, which is the security guarantor with its armed forces of the welfare of the small Turkish Cypriot minority on the island. So the Greek Cypriots, although they are a majority on the island, feel weak, vulnerable and exposed because the friend of the minority is a big 600 pound gorilla which is only 40 miles away. What we've had in Ireland for so long was that each side felt itself to be the weak one, the besieged one, the isolated and vulnerable one, and therefore put responsibility on the other side as the stronger party to be magnanimous and start making the concessions from a position of strength. And for a very long time, we were in the business, which we see in the Middle East, you see it in the Arab-Israeli dispute all the time, of mutual delegitimization, of questioning the legitimacy of the other side. And what's happened in the last 10 years is that partnership, power-sharing, governmental arrangements have been put in place in Northern Ireland between Protestant and Catholic, between Unionist and Nationalist. The guns have gone silent, the guns have been decommissioned, they've been put away for good. At the same, and that has been a great, that power sharing has been a great validation, a great attraction, it's, it's had great attractions in some respects for the Unionist Protestant community in Northern Ireland because it is, after all, administration within Northern Ireland. At the same time, at the same time, and as part of the agreement, we have had formal links between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland greatly reinforced, which appeals to those who aspire to a united Ireland. So you have ministerial and governmental councils, you have parliamentarians between Northern Ireland working much more closely together. Southern Ireland, which was a very poor backwater for most of the 20th century, has recently put aside half a billion euro, which is the guts of a billion dollars, for infrastructural development in Northern Ireland, which was wealthy in the past, which is part of the United Kingdom. And we, our taxpayers, are paying well over half a billion euro over the coming years to invest in social and economic progress in Northern Ireland. So those kinds of, of linkages, a partnership in Northern Ireland across community, partnership between the two parts of Ireland, and then, I must tell you, finally, a much closer relationship between the government of the United Kingdom in London and the government of Ireland in Dublin. In fact, we have got where we are today as much as anything because the relationship between the two sovereign states and their governments, between Britain and Ireland, has been transformed for the better. There's been a rich and deep collaboration and partnership at all levels of government between Ireland and the United Kingdom. The relationship between the two prime ministers, Tony Blair and Bertie Ahern, was for long years the locomotive driving forward the peace process to a successful outcome in Northern Ireland because it was in everybody's interests. And part of the reason, my final comment, 
part of the reason why the Irish